All right, so I've actually been wanting to make a video about this for quite a while, but first let me start with a story, because why not? And they're fun. <laughs> so a few months ago, um, I was having a conversation with like an acquaintance friend type, and we started talking about spiritual things, naturally, because like anytime I can suck people into that kind of conversation, I'm there for it. So I brought up that I was an ex-New Ager, that I used to practice things like manifestation, visualization, um, I went to go see a psychic at one point, and her response shocked me because she's like, oh, yes, I do the Christian version of those things. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> you do what? Um, I listened because that's my natural inclination. My natural instinct is to gather as much information as I can um, so that I know what I'm dealing with. So I know the person's position at least. And she mentioned a very interesting book that y'all might be familiar with. Physics of Heaven. <laughs> you all know how much I love this book. We got in a conversation about this and I told her, yeah, actually I have read this book and I'm familiar with, you know, certain teachers and leaders at Bethel. What was interesting is that this is something that was actively being taught to her at her church by her church leaders in my city. And I figured first, number one, I would love to visit this church. Number two, I felt compelled to, to make a video about this, specifically about this topic, because this is coming up more and more. And I had the opportunity to talk more with her about this subject, about this topic. And uh, we are still having an ongoing discussion. It's very fruitful. It's, it's been nice. It's been good. She doesn't agree with me on everything. And I don't agree with her on everything. As time has gone on, though, there have been certain things that she does see in stark contrast to what scripture teaches. And I'm going to share with you in this video things that I kind of shared with her. And because it's been done in such a respectful dialogue, in such a respectful way, she's still listening to me. <laughs> um, so hint, hint at people who are trying to reach people that you disagree with. Doing it with love and respect is, is number one rule, in, in my opinion. So in thinking of this video and coming up with the content for it and what to talk about, I was trying to think of like a productive way to, to bring up the problem here and what needs to be addressed. And I thought the best thing to do is actually just go right for the source, uh, which is chapter five in this book, which is literally labeled authentic versus counterfeit. Now I'm gonna be very, very clear about this because almost every single time I make a video about somebody else or somebody else's beliefs or whatever the case may be, I have people say that I'm being harsh and judgmental and I, I mean, I don't know how. <laughs> and to that, I would just simply say that when you disagree with somebody, I think it's interesting that in today's you know age, it's automatically equated to some sort of like harsh judgment that y you like hate the person or something. And I think that it's perfectly fine to disagree with somebody respectfully. So this is how I'm gonna do this, all right? I'm gonna respectfully portray how he views this. And the author of this particular chapter is Jonathan Welton. And he's somebody who's, uh, of course, involved a lot at Bethel. So um, I'm gonna respectfully portray how he views this as best as I can. And then I'm gonna share my disagreement. And though there's much more than this, I'd encourage you to actually read this chapter if you're at a point uh, where you'd say you're spiritually mature enough to read a point of view like this that's different than yours and not be spiritually stumbled or maybe develop an unnecessary hostile position towards them. So for now, I'll be summarizing the main points made in this chapter. So the belief goes that for every counterfeit spiritual experience or practice out there, such as clairaudience, which is speaking to angels, channeling spirits, spirit guides, spell casting, trances, astrology, auras, psychic powers, or just fill in the blank with any new age teaching. Then in this mindset, there's an authentic version of this new age teaching that actually 
belongs to God, to the church. The devil has just basically hijacked it. So our time needs to be spent not pointing out the darkness, okay, but focusing on the light, reclaiming what the enemy has stolen from the church. His claim is that the way that God moves in power looks a lot like the new age. And this has scared many Christians away from operating in the gifts of the spirit. And he's saying that the gifts of the spirit look similar to the counterfeit. Now, according to him, how to tell the difference is to test the origin. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, among others is quoted to support these things saying, to test everything and hold on to what is good. To know whether it's true or not is to determine the source and origin of the experience. How this is done is if you've declared Jesus as the Lord of your life and have acknowledged that Jesus has risen from the dead, then this is a test of what power source a person is operating in. If they can say yes to these two things, then they believe that God would not allow them to be deceived. A really popular scripture that's quoted is Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, about a son asking for a fish why would a good father hand him a snake? So why would God, the perfect father, give them deception when they ask for a spiritual experience from him? Basically, he says, and the logic goes, that they shouldn't be afraid of the supernatural if they're a Christian. Just to further clarify, the logic goes that if they're asking the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural, asking for a fish, then they don't need to be afraid of receiving a counterfeit, getting a snake. So the concern in this aspect is reclaiming the stolen goods from the enemy without being deceived with the counterfeits. Then there's the accusation that say somebody says that they're operating in something other than the Holy Spirit. Then the person who's making the accusation might have a religious spirit and actually be committing the unforgivable sin and should be disregarded. This is actually something that my friend mentioned to me. She's like, well, maybe you have a religious spirit. And I thought that that was really interesting that that was her first conclusion. It wasn't that she could possibly be deceived. It was, oh, I have the religious spirit. So basically they are there to reclaim what the new age has stolen from the church. So that's the basic mindset behind it. And I wanna give my respectful disagreement about this idea, especially as an ex New Ager. So first, just laying this out there guys, but no, I am not a reformed cessationist. And I don't know why I get accused of that almost every time I talk about something like this. I'm open but cautious, I'm a continuationist. Uh, but yeah, I still believe that God functions in the supernatural, I just think it's rare. And when it does occur, it's aligned with scripture. Okay, so if God does perform a miracle or there are gifts of the spirit, it will always point you towards Jesus, repentance, and a hunger for the Bible, not experience. So to start with this viewpoint that Jonathan has in this chapter, if I'm fair, not everything about this is wrong as there are aspects of evil that make sense in light of good. But what I'm arguing is that this is a whole different situation. And I've looked at his perspective. I've read this book actually a few times and I believe that I understand it correctly to the best of my ability to correctly disagree with it. So, is there an authentic to every counterfeit experience? Is everything in the new age a counterfeit to that actually belongs to the church? So to start, um, I would argue that it's just simply not true that every new age practice has a sanctified version of it. It's not some sort of perversion of the truth. Okay, so in the realm of morality, for example, is there a sanctified version of adultery? stealing? Why was something like witchcraft, channeling, necromancy? There is no sanctified practice of these things. These are not imitations or perversions of something good. They're just outright defiance and disobedience. So I think part of the justification for this that's made is if there's say a psychic, for example, misusing the gift of prophecy, then that means that there's real prophets out there. If there are people speaking in Kundalini tongues, then that means that that was hijacked by the devil and used for darkness. I'm um, arguing first, the devil can't steal what already belongs to him. 
And though I understand their mindset of thinking the New Age has hijacked gifts of the spirit, I don't agree with the conclusion that they make. Second, in my opinion, I believe that the yearning to go into the New Age in a lot of these charismatic circles is because they're so hungry for experience and revival that they'll go into forbidden territory to, to, to get that. And the scary part is they think they're protected in doing this. And what I mean by that is the argument presented in this book goes that if you're saved, then the Holy Spirit won't let you be deceived if you practice these things. He says that he has more faith that Jesus wouldn't allow him or others to be deceived and that the enemy can't override that. But throughout scripture and ironically experience, <laughs> We see that this is not the case. You cannot practice willful sin and have God protect you. It says in 1 John chapter 3 that those who obey God, the children of God, don't participate and practice willful sin. This is a position to take, a lifestyle, a choice. Ephesians 5.11 says, have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness, but rather to expose them. So astral projection, chakras, auras, talking to the dead, channeling, reading palms, astrology, just to name a few, are not counterfeit. It's disobedience. You do not redeem these things. You divorce them, okay? God was never the author of pagan practices. So if the argument is that there's a counterfeit, then that means that an authentic exists is not consistent or realistic. You don't redeem sin. Okay, no more than you can redeem immoral practices like adultery or stealing or lying. And 1 Thessalonians is used in this chapter to say, to test everything and hold on to what is good as a scripture to say that we need to test what we're experiencing, that if it's from the spirit or from the enemy. From what I understand, he's saying, yes, you can participate in these things, in these teachings to bring them back to the church because that's the counterfeit. That's what you're seeing. And interestingly, in verse 22, after it says to test these things, he says to abstain from every form of evil. In the third letter of John chapter one, verse 11, it says, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God and the one who does evil has seen God. So to imitate pagan practices according to scripture is evil. God clearly directs to have nothing to do with these things. But the thing is that Paul here in this letter, and this is important, he's giving instructions on how to test prophetic words. This is really important because we have no instruction to sift through pagan faiths and try to pick out what's good from them. Paul is saying, test this intrinsically good practice God has ordained to make sure the prophets haven't mixed their own interpretation and application in this. Paul is not saying, test these intrinsically demonic practices to find some helpful elements in them. <laughs> As I said before, the argument is that you must determine the source to know if it's a counterfeit or not. So what's their source, the origin, according to this chapter, which in a way is a little inconsistent because if the origin is the experience of the Holy Spirit, it seems like there has to be a standard of explanation of how the Holy Spirit functions, which I see is laid out in the Bible. The problem that I see, in my opinion, um, from what I've observed, is that people rely on their direct communication from God rather than digging into the Bible. So what's the point of digging into the dusty book on your shelf if you can hear from God directly? <laughs> But the point he's making is that if you're a child of God and you're experiencing this, you're having this spiritual experience, then it must be of God because he wouldn't hand you a snake. And I say that the filter should always be the word, not experience. So I would argue that 1 Thessalonians, the chapter that he uses, um, does not apply here for a few reasons. In this scripture, we are to test the content and fruit of a practice that God himself has ordained for his church. On the other hand, we have explicit commands not to blend paganism with Christianity. Second Corinthians chapter six speaks about not blending darkness with light. God has not ordained that pagan teachings are good for the church. He's ordained that they're bad. <laughs> so to take a passage telling us to test and weigh the fruits of a God ordained practice, which is prophecy, and apply that to testing and weighing pagan practices 
is to ignore the clear fact that God has called one good and the other evil. Then there's the argument that people are afraid that they're going to be deceived because they know that it looks a lot like the New Age, that they're afraid to reclaim the authentic because they consider the power of the counterfeit to be overwhelmingly deceiving. So the advice that is given here, that he gives, is to have more faith in the Lord's ability to keep you than the devil's ability to steal you away and that you can never be snatched out of Jesus's hand. And he quotes John 10, 28 for that as a defense. And what I would say to this is that if you're making the choice to do this out of his will, he will hand you over to it. I am literally proof of that. <laughs> By this logic, why would I leave the New Age then? As someone who practiced New Age as a Christian, I technically wasn't doing anything wrong then. And there are many people that I know that practice New Age practices like uh, tarot cards, astral travel, astrology, crystal energies, fill in the blank, and much more. And they call themselves Christians. And some even ask for God's protection and believe that they get it. They actually believe that Jesus protects them, yet they go beyond his warnings and boundaries. They disobey him. What's interesting is that we actually do this all the time in life, not just with new age practices. Like we know we shouldn't engage in certain activities, but we do it anyways, hoping God will protect us. So, okay, wanna mess around with sorcery? Make toxic life decisions? Invoke the dead? Align your chakras? Go right ahead, cause God's got this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Obedience is an act of worship and love for God, and it trumps experience every time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 10, it speaks about food sacrifice to idols and whether it's appropriate to participate in eating food that was given to a false god. And one of Paul's many points is about not stumbling someone else by participating in this thing. And so that's just eating the food. Imagine practicing their religion. <laughs> in chapter 10, Paul tells Christians that partaking in pagan practices provoked God to jealousy and caused them to participate in worship with demons. So when we fellowship with such things, this offends God. See, I think part of the deception is that if someone believes that it's impossible to be deceived, that God would never hand them a snake when they've asked for a fish, then it won't be a possibility for them in their mind that they've delved into some forbidden practices. They're too enamored with the experience to consider they've been deceived. Contacting the dead, witchcraft, crystal energy, manifestation, all of this can be done and is permissible and safe as long as we're Christians. It should be that because we're Christians, we shouldn't do this stuff. So if someone claims to be in right relationship with God, and if we're operating in realms and experiences outside of what's outlined in scripture, then by definition, this means we're not in right relationship with God. And this is why I emphasize over and over again, the importance of reading and studying scripture. And guys, by the way, he names these things by name in this chapter. I'm not putting words in his mouth. I'm literally taking from this chapter what he himself has said. Just a direct quote from page 49 in chapter, it's chapter five? Yes, it's chapter, okay, chapter five. <laughs> With all this talk about counterfeits and authentic, by now you may be scratching your head hoping for examples. The best examples I have found are in the New Age movement. They have been trafficking the church's stolen goods for a long time. According to him, I have found throughout scripture at least 75 examples of things that the New Age has counterfeited, such as having a spirit guide, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and more. These actually belong to the church but they have been stolen and cleverly repackaged. This whole chapter is about that. So I wanna read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses four through five to make a point about what we might be seeing in some of these practices. Uh, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone claims and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, and if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. 
Paul is rebuking his Corinthian brothers and sisters for abusing the gifts of the Spirit, for putting up with a different spirit. There is such a thing as acting in a different spirit, and this is what brings forth sin and hurts our relationship with God and stumbles others. So overall, I don't want people to be afraid of God actually being God and working in the supernatural when he chooses to. I think that some people might be afraid of disagreeing with what they're seeing in some churches uh, because they're afraid they're going to be accused of blaspheming the spirit, as I mentioned before. Um, I think that this can be a pretty terrifying thing for some people, but the one fail-safe we always have is the Bible. If we are rooted in scripture, not experience, then suddenly the scales fall off and we have a foundation of truth that is objective instead of based on feelings and emotions which change all the time and are unreliable. I think that the more I look into this, the more I see a lust for the supernatural. And this can lead to some pretty fringe beliefs and they're just getting like fringier. <laughs> So I hope this was helpful for you guys and hopefully it encourages you to get in your word and pray for others. Hopefully I relayed my thoughts with clarity and respect. If you'd like more information on this topic, as always, I will have more resources in the description of this video.